Thanks, John. <clears throat> Welcome to our earnings call for the second quarter of 2021. Earlier today, we published our shareholder letter summarizing the major developments from the last quarter. I'd like to briefly describe a few of the highlights here. First, and most significantly, we are excited to report that we have now built and are currently testing our first 10 layer cells in our commercially relevant form factor. In the shareholder letter, we published preliminary data from our cycle life tests and early capacity retention and cycling performance remain similar to what we've shown for single and four layer cells. Our goal was to have 10 layer cells by the end of 2021, so we are encouraged to have our first 10 layer cells this early. To be more specific, the development of 10 layer cells has been the result of a number of concrete improvements to our separator manufacturing process. Taken together, these improvements result in a step change increase in both separator quality and consistency. As we baseline these improvements, we expect positive knock-on effects to accrue to our development process as we progress through our manufacturing scale-up roadmap. As we've said since first going public, separator quality and consistency are key technical parameters, and this step change improvement is an encouraging sign that our focus on this area is paying off. To put this achievement in context, it's helpful to think about how far we've come. In December 2020, we showed our first data on single layer cells. Then in February, we showed our first four layer cells. To now be able to share an early look at full size 10 layer cells in July is very exciting to us. And we believe that the rapid rate of progress to this point bodes well for our development plans going forward. In another important development, we made and tested our anode free lithium metal cells with a low cost iron phosphate LFP cathode and confirmed that our chemistry and cell design is compatible with LFP. We believe this demonstrates the commercial flexibility of our cathode agnostic solid state lithium metal platform, which allows us to extend our product offering to a broad spectrum of the automotive market. In addition to these exciting technical results, much of our focus this past quarter has been on installing high volume manufacturing and automation tools on our engineering line as a precursor to the build out of our pre-pilot QS0 facility. Such high volume tools will allow us to further refine our manufacturing process, reduce variability, and feed our learn fast and iterate development process as we continue to work towards accomplishing our year-end goals. For example, we expect our high volume continuous flow heat treatment equipment to improve separator production throughput by an order of magnitude over the current process, as well as to significantly improve the quality of our separators as a result of more uniform processing. Just as important as our tools is our team. We've grown our company headcount by 20% over the last 90 days, with a particular focus on attracting experienced high-tech manufacturing professionals. Among many others, we are pleased to welcome Selena Mikolajak from Panasonic and Tesla as our VP of Manufacturing Engineering, and Clayton Patch from Micron Technology Inc. and IM Flash Technologies as VP of Manufacturing. Our focus for the rest of 2021 is to build many more 10-layer cells to collect performance data and comprehensively characterize and optimize the cell design. In addition, we will continue working closely with Volkswagen and other customers as we push towards next year's customer sampling targets. Lastly, I'd like to take a moment to look at the bigger picture. This last quarter has seen an incredible volume of electrification announcements from automakers all over the world, with a growing number committed to phasing out combustion engines entirely. This comes as governments across the world are tightening restrictions on combustion engine vehicles and accelerating the pace at which automakers are required to switch. The EV market is seeing enormous growth in major markets, and this growth looks set to continue over the short and long term. But it's also important to keep in mind that EV sales are still less than 5% of all new cars sold. And in some ways, the first 5% is the easiest to address with current technology. We believe that selling EVs to the remaining 95% of car buyers will require batteries that are not just marginally better than today's standard, but significantly better on key metrics such as range, charge time, cost, and safety. We believe the automotive market is starting to appreciate that incremental progress in battery technology will ultimately be insufficient to meet the requirements of drivers, necessitating step function improvements like those delivered through our anodeless lithium metal approach. Although there are challenges ahead of us, we are confident that we have the team, resources, and fundamental technology to overcome them, and every major hurdle we clear becomes a moat that strengthens our competitive position in the race to capture the next generation battery market. In short, we are encouraged by the results we've seen this quarter, and we are excited to continue our progress towards commercial deployment of our technology and share more developments with our shareholders in the months ahead. With that, I'll hand it over to our CFO, Kevin Hedrick, to say a few words on our financial performance before we open it up to Q&A. Kevin? Thank you, Jagdeep. 
In the second quarter, our operating expenses were $50 million. Excluding stock-based compensation, operating expenses were $38 million. This level of spend was in line with our expectations entering the quarter. The full year, we expect cash operating expenses to be in the range of $130 million to $160 million, consistent with our guidance from last quarter's earnings call. CapEx in the second quarter was approximately $30 million. For the full year, we now see CapEx tracking higher than previous guidance of $130 million to $160 million, primarily due to a pull forward of the timing of QS0 pre-pilot manufacturing line spend from 2022 into 2021. This reflects progress setting specifications, engaging with vendors, ordering equipment, and advancing facility projects. Our overall spend for QS0 remains in line with our previous expectations. Our plan to end this year with greater than $1.3 billion in liquidity also remains unchanged. We'll update CapEx guidance for 2021 in the Q3 shareholder letter when timing on payments related to QS0 comes into clearer focus. QS0 is a vital step in our growth. From QS0, we plan to produce battery cells for R&D test cars in 2023 and to establish a mass manufacturing system blueprint. Learnings from QS0, we believe, will help de-risk our QS1 scale-up. With respect to cash, we spent $63 million on operations and CapEx in the second quarter. We'll update guidance for full year free cash flow burn in the Q3 shareholder letter. Our company achieved progress on development and manufacturing while maintaining a strong balance sheet. We ended the second quarter with more than $1.5 billion in liquidity. We continue to expect to exit 2021 with over $1.3 billion, sufficient capital, we believe, to fully fund QuantumScape through initial QS1 production and additionally contribute to the subsequent QS1 expansion. Our gap net income for the quarter was $81 million, including the impact of $131 million in non-cash fair value adjustment of the assumed common stock warrants. Excluding this non-cash adjustment, the net loss for the quarter was approximately $50 million, in line with expectations. We're excited about the progress this quarter and look forward to the opportunities ahead. We'd like to thank our investors for supporting our mission to commercialize our solid-state lithium metal batteries and to help accelerate the mass market adoption of electric vehicles. One final comment regarding the recently announced public warrant redemption before passing back to John. Of the 11.5 million public warrants originally issued, most have already been exercised. As of the recent redemption press release date, only approximately 1.5 million remain outstanding. We believe redemption of the public warrants is an important step to further simplify and streamline our capital structure. For more information, please review our press release and 8K filing on July 23rd. With that, over to you, John. John? Okay, thanks, Kevin. We'll begin today's Q&A portion with a few questions we've received from investors over the SAE app and in our IR inbox. Our first question is, if you had to convert a traditional lithium-ion manufacturing facility to a QuantumScape facility, how would you do it? How much would the cost savings be versus building a new factory from scratch? Yeah, John, the first thing I'd say is that given the demand for batteries that we're currently seeing and the supply constraints, no one is really talking about repurposing factories. Current factory capacity will continue to be needed going forward, and new factories need to be built each year to meet the growing demand. Our default plan will be to build new factories for QS1 and QS2. But if you did want to repurpose lithium-ion factories, the main changes would be, first, we don't need an anode manufacturing line since our design is anode-less. This would allow us to reuse the anode coders as cathode coders, increasing the capacity of the line uh, without adding cost. Uh, second, we could also reuse existing stacker tools for prismatic cells to make our cells. Uh, and finally, we could simplify the formation area since we don't have the need to form an anode SEI given we don't have an anode. Uh, so we believe we'd be able to leverage most of what you find in a lithium-ion factory uh, and get commensurate cost savings if we were to go that route. Okay, makes sense. What gives you confidence you'll be able to manufacture at scale? What processes are unproven or require changes versus today's lithium-ion facilities? Okay, so fundamentally, the main difference between our approach and conventional lithium-ion manufacturing is that we have this unique ceramic separator that enables us to use the pure metallic lithium anode. So what gives us confidence that we can manufacture at scale is two things. First, the fact that this separator is based on precursor materials that are earth abundant with multiple suppliers of multiple continents. And second, that the tools we use to make the separator are already used at scale in either the battery or ceramics industries today, so we can leverage the scale of those industries without requiring new custom tool development. Uh, the remainder of these questions are from the SEA. Sales of stock by key team members are being perceived by some as extreme, with one shareholder claiming that our CTO, Tim Holm, sold 50% of his holdings, noting that our chief legal officer sold shares, and our chief development officer sold two-thirds of his shares. So the question becomes, is there anything to read into those share sales, and can you comment on the size of the share sales? John, first, 
the percent sale references in the question are not accurate to correct the record here. As of the end of the quarter, Tim, our co-founder and chief technology officer, holds 96% of his prior holdings as of June 30th, 2021. Mohit Singh, our chief development officer, holds 86%. And Mike McCarthy, our chief legal officer, holds 83%. Yeah, if I can just add, as I mentioned on our last call, outside of satisfying tax obligations, I remain committed to not selling any shares until we've delivered a prototype in a commercially relevant form factor uh, to Volkswagen. Okay, our next question. How soon will you be going into production, and can you comment on the ongoing discussions you're having with automakers? So on the production side, our plans are to go into pre-pilot production with our QS0 line in 2023, followed by commercial production in the 2024-25 timeframe. On the customer front, I'll say a couple things. Uh, one is inbound interest remains strong. Uh, and second, uh, uh, in fact, because demand appears to be higher than our near-term plan capacity, we actually won't be able to work with every prospective customer that's expressed interest. Uh, this allows us to be a little more strategic about which customers we choose to work with. And finally, I'll add that our policy is not to discuss customer deals until they're final. Uh, in addition, many OEMs consider their badly supplier decisions to be proprietary. Uh, so out of respect for them, we usually let them be the ones uh, that announce their partnerships. Since Tesla's 4680 lithium-ion battery cell is advertised as having similar performance to your battery, and it's less likely to cause a fire versus an internal combustion engine, what's the real advantage of a solid-state cell? Yeah, so the Tesla 4680 incorporates uh, a number of incremental advances, uh, including things like higher nickel content on the cathode side, uh, cell to pack design, dry electro processing for cathode manufacturing, uh, and so on. Uh, but I'll note that all of these cathode side improvements are available to us as well, since we're cathode agnostic. So when you couple these improvements with our lithium metal anode, you still end up getting better energy density than lithium ion uh, because of the elimination of the carbon or silicon anode. Uh, and we don't believe you can do better than an anode-less lithium metal cell on metrics like energy density and fast charging cost uh, because uh, we believe the conventional carbon or carbon silicon anode is, in fact, a key limiting factor uh, for all those parameters. What do you see as the most significant technical challenges to market acceptance and to full-scale production? So the main challenge is scaling up our separator production, which, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we believe is achievable since the precursor materials are earth-abundant commodities and the production processes are, and tools are already used at scale today. Uh, the second challenge, of course, uh, was to increase our layer counts, but our announcement today uh, makes clear that we've already made strong progress on that front, so we feel uh, good about uh, our ability to uh, increase layer counts. Okay, our last question from the SAE app. Do you plan to test your battery from the third party to prove all the claims in your reports are true? So as we've said before, we believe the best independent testing is testing conducted by our prospective customers. And of course, we've had multiple customers test ourselves in their labs. Uh, however, some investors have still asked that we use a third-party lab to validate our uh, results. Uh, and to be responsive to those investors, uh, I'll say that we have submitted ourselves for independent testing, and we'll share results when we have them. I want to point out, though, that we're, we don't intend to do this for every generation of, of our cells, uh, as our focus remains on providing cells uh, to our customers. Okay, thanks so much, guys. We're now ready to begin the Q&A portion of today's call. Operator, please open the lines for questions. It is a reminder to ask a question. You will need to press star 1 on your touchtone telephone. Your first question is from okay, Rod from Flash Rod of Blog Research. Your line is open. Hi, everybody. Um, I wanted to ask you um, two different questions. One is just you characterize the 10-layer 10, 10 cell as evidence of improvement in manufacturing. Can you maybe explain that a little bit for us? And, and in the lab, can you maybe characterize um, what you were learning on, on manufacturability and specifically any, any kind of specific data points on the progress you're making on speed of production and, and yield, just given that you just said that the, the second uh, challenge is, is uh, scaling up manufacturing? Sure. Hey, Rod. Um, so uh, on the question, let me answer the question about uh, the, um, uh, the manufacturing improvement first. So the, the, uh, at, at the core of the improvement is, as we mentioned, is better uniformity, better quality, better consistency of, of the films. Uh, that, it turns out, is one of the uh, critical um, parameters for uh, 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 better performance on uh, essentially all the metrics that we really care about from, uh, you know, from uh, uh, cycling behavior to uh, uh, you know, power, low temperature. All those things are, are improved if you have uh, better quality and better consistency in your films. So this new process, uh, which represents, as I mentioned, a, a uh, a combination of a number of, uh, of improvements uh, on the manufacturing side uh, allowed us to make better films. Better films give us uh, a uh, better yield, which means um, you know more uh, of the films that we start are usable. So that helps us 
uh, deal with the fact that a 10 layer cell requires 10 times as many films. So uh, having more films that are, that are good it helps there. Uh, and then secondly, as you stack up multiple films, uh, if you have non-uniformities, then, then you can, you know, you can compound the, uh, the effect of those non-uniformities. So, so better quality, uh, uh helps you, uh, better achieve, uh, 10 layer cells. Um, so that, that, that was the, uh, the, the question about 10 layers. I think, uh, Ron, if I call, you also asked about, uh, scale up plans. Is that right? The speed of production and yield, just any, any, um, any metrics that you could share with us on the progress you're making there? Yeah, so one, one thing we did say in the letter, uh, if you noted it, was that um, the, the new tools that we're installing, for example, this new uh, heat treatment tool that we refer to, and there's a photo, in fact, in the letter of the tool, you can see just the physical size and scale of it. It's, you know, these, are, these are big industrial kind of tools. Uh, that's literally an order of magnitude more, uh, you know, more throughput than the tools that we're currently using in our baseline process. So uh, you know, th- those are the kinds of uh, you know, step function improvements in, in throughput that, uh, that are needed uh, to be able to both you know, uh, uh, provide enough cells for multi-layer development, uh, as well as uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, provide higher volumes of, of completed cells to, uh, to both test internally and provide to our customers. So uh, that's the reason why we feel uh, like the scale-up um, you know, progress is, uh, has been strong over the, over the last quarter. Okay, thank, thanks. And just secondly, if I, if I can, the comments you made on this uh, iron phosphate um, with, with your technology were pretty interesting. So in, in the market today, um, I, I think that um, LFP cells are like 20% less expensive, like 80 bucks a kilowatt hour versus 100 would it be the same for your cell? So if you were targeting $70 per kilowatt hour cells in 2027 with nickel, would it, could it be in the 50s for iron-based? And um, is that something that you're, you're sensing from your customers um, expressing interest? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, I don't think we've given precise guidance on our, on our cost structure, but um, uh, here, here's what I can provide. Uh, there's two different, uh, uh, I think, parts of the cost story that could be helpful uh, for your models. Uh, first of all, of course, as you already know, Rod, on the anode side, uh, we believe there is no um, lower cost anode than uh, an anode-less lithium metal design because there's no anode at all. You can't get lower than, than zero cost there. When you couple that with an LFP anode, uh, LFP cathode, excuse me, uh, you then get additional benefits because now the cathode active material is also relatively low cost. Now, the prices, as you know, of the actual active materials, you know, the spot prices fluctuate over time. Uh, you know, recent prices for uh, normal NMC cathode material may have been, I don't know, in the low $20 or you know, low 20s or in terms of dollars per uh, kilogram. Um, the, the price, the comparable price for LFP cathodes, uh, you know, uh, if I recall correctly, you know, maybe recently we're having in, in the mid single digits dollars per kilogram. So that's a, a pretty significant difference in cost. Uh, and then given that, you know, you've already eliminated the cost of the anode with an anode-less design, uh, the cathode ends up being, you know, a, a, a larger fraction of the overall cost. Uh, so having a lower cost cathode actually uh, really helps you there. Uh, so to net it out, um, I think what we believe is that the, the, the cost advantage we laid out in our um, original model of 15 to 20%, uh, you know, of, uh, lower cost than, uh, than conventional lithium ion cells because of the anode, we think that roughly holds even for the LFP cells. Uh, and so the beauty of coupling a lithium metal anode-less design with LFP uh, is, is a couple of things. One is you end up with literally the lowest cost possible design that we know of. You take a, a, you know, a, a zero cost anode and couple that with a very low cost cathode. So you get a very cost advantage uh, uh, cell. Uh, but secondly, you take the fundamental disadvantage of LFP, which of course it is, is that it doesn't have a lot of energy density. Uh, and you you uh, address that directly by uh, coupling with lithium metal and taking it up to a range where now it's it's approaching that of today's conventional uh, NMC based batteries. So it's a really beautiful combination, right? You 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 in one fell swoop end up with a lower you know we believe the lowest cost solution that you can have for these kinds of systems, uh, and B you simultaneously address the biggest weakness in LFP, right? Uh, so we, we we reported this demonstration uh, really to help uh, the market understand that you know um, uh, you know we are cathode agnostic. Uh, you know, we have the ability to work with whatever capital our OEMs want. Uh, and this is not uh, some kind of, uh, you know, battle or race between LFP and lithium metal anode. Those are completely different, uh, you know, axes of the, the, the cell, uh, uh, you know, uh, multidimensional space. And, and um, you know, we, we can, we can uh, uh, advance on both those axes uh, simultaneously. Uh, so to the extent that LFP becomes important for a certain um, uh, uh, subsector of the automotive market, um, you know, uh, th- th- we believe that a lithium metal anode-less design paired with that LFP uh, becomes the best possible LFP, and that's what's exciting about about that result. Mm-hmm. Great, thank you. Absolutely. Our next question is from Jose Asimendi of J.P. Morgan. Please ask your question. Yeah, thanks very much, Jose and J.P. Morgan. Uh, J.P. and Kevin. Um, a couple of uh, questions, please. The first one with regards to uh, QS zero. 
Uh, can you give us some you know, rough timing in terms of by when do you expect to have installed most of the machinery for, for QS0? Uh, by when have you spent, uh, spent most of the CapEx uh, for, for, for this facility, for that facility? Second, uh, Kevin, can you give us a, a sense of how many people you're trying to bring on board uh, by the end of the year? I mean, your, your headcount is, is rising rapidly, but, but, you know, sort of end of the year, where do you plan to, you know, to, to stand? And, and the three uh, for Jack Deep, um, you know, I think some interesting hires. Can you talk a little bit about the background from, from Selena, uh, coming from Panasonic and, and Tesla, and how she can help you industrialize uh, the, the production and, and, you know, accelerate that trans- transition to QS0 and, and QS1? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, Jose, thanks for the questions. Let, let, this is Jack Deep. Let me go ahead and take the last one first because it's relatively straightforward. Then I'll hand it over to Kevin to take the first two. So uh, uh, we're delighted to have Selena on board. I mean, she, um, as you know from her background, she ran the manufacturing engineering group at Panasonic at the Giga Factory in, in Reno, uh, which we believe is one of the largest, if not the largest, operating battery facility uh, in the world. Um, you know, uh, but she's not just a manufacturing expert who's worked with super high volume, you know, production lines uh, at Panasonic. She happens to be a manufacturing expert who is a battery expert <laughs> because her previous career before this uh, was very deep into battery. She started out working at um, what's now called Exponent, what used to be called uh, Failure Analysis Associates, which was um, you know, one of the pioneers in battery safety analysis. Uh, she obviously went over to Tesla where she, you know, uh, uh, during her uh, tenure there, they introduced, um, you know, many of the key models that we associate with Tesla now. Um, uh, and, and then she went over to Uber. So, so she's got just an amazing combination of really deep understanding of battery. She can engage with our engineers at the engineering level, but she also understands all of the uh, uh, complexity and sophistication that you need to run a super high volume battery line where you're making millions of cells um, you know, on the line. Uh, because at that scale, you know, little things that you never think about uh, have to be addressed explicitly. Things like, you know, are the blades that you're using to cut your films you know, um, uh, on the right sharpening schedule. Right? I mean, those things get blunt overuse. You know, do you have, you know, supply chain you know, in order? Uh, there's just a lot of things that you don't have to worry about when you're doing small scale manufacturing that become real issues that can hold up the line. Having somebody on board who's dealt with all those things firsthand in one of the world's uh, highest volume battery production lines, is fantastic. And when you couple that to Clayton Patch, Clayton uh, is the head of, so Selena runs, will run manufacturing engineering, which is the group that does all of the engineering for the tools and processes that we use. And then Clayton Patch will run the actual production line. Uh, and Clayton's background comes from semiconductors. The reason why that's relevant is semiconductors, of course, um, are very um, aggressive at using things like metrology and, and um, you know, getting data uh, on, on the processing of, of the materials uh, to be able to keep the process you know, under, within the control limits. Uh, and and um, you know, a lot of that expertise is going to be very relevant as we scale up the separator line. Uh, you know, even though it's a ceramic line, uh, a lot of the, 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 the uh, a lot of the, the metrology techniques we're using uh, are, are, you know, really, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, we, we can leverage uh, some of the techniques used in, in semiconductors uh, to, to get tight controls over, over operating con- uh, constraints and, and, and parameters. So, you know, th- those, those two are just, uh, you know, examples of the types of hires that, that we're making uh, that we think are really going to enhance our ability to execute successfully on this next phase of our journey. Uh, let me turn it over to Kevin to address the first two questions you asked. Uh, Jose, thank you for the questions. I recall the first question was around some of the timeline for QS0. To answer the question on timeline and uh, operation, uh, we've given guidance that uh, QS0 will produce battery cells for prospective customers to uh, be put into R&D cars in 23. Working backwards, we'll we'll need to have most of the machines installed and the CapEx spent in 2022. Uh, As for the second question around headcount, uh, we mentioned in today's letter that we have headcount of just over 400. Um, We haven't given guidance as to headcount for the end of the year, but if you could get in the right zip code by looking at our uh, our, our cash off X um, and, uh, and to extrapolate it with that growth. In, in the quarter, we spent uh, $34 million on that OPEX, excluding depreciation and stock-based comp, and we stick to our guidance of 130 to 160 by year-end, which implies that that number will be increasing. So if you put those, those two together, you'll get in the right zip code of uh, total total headcount. That's very clear. Thank you very much for the color. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Thanks, Jose. Our next question is from Adam Jonas of Morgan Stanley. Please ask your question. Uh, thanks very much. A uh, really interesting call. I, I think that the uh, LFP uh, testing, again, also potentially really, really significant. Um, can I ask for clarification? You, you, you said you believe um, that using your form factor and LFP battery uh, could achieve um, 600 to 700 watt hours per liter. Curious if you could give us a range of, of gravimetric density on that as well per kg. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure uh, we have those numbers, obviously, because we, we did the, uh, the modeling. Um, I don't have them uh, handy on Adam, but, but we're happy to, uh, uh, to make those available as well. It, it's a great question. I, I would expect those to be, you know, roughly, um, you know, uh, uh, comparable uh, because, you, you know, you are 
uh, uh, eliminating you know the the uh, panel uh, layer uh, of the creation of the cell. Um, but let me we, we just let me get back to you on on the precise uh, metrics there. Okay. Um, could you also um, remind us like the cobalt content of your cells versus conventional? I understand that's going to be uh, cathode chemistry dependent. Sure. Um, but yeah, could you give us some yeah, some of those? Absolutely. Because there's so much focus yeah, around yeah. cobalt. Yeah. Help us out again. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the, the current the current chemistry that uh, we, we are, we've been using is the 811 chemistry. Um, so that would be you know 10% cobalt. Uh, however, there are new chemistries that um, uh, that that are um, you know uh, uh, being offered by the cathode providers that are even lower cobalt content than that. So there's some, for example, that are you know seven or eight percent cobalt. Uh, so that that number continues to decline uh, for two reasons. As obviously you know, one is uh, you know it, it improves the cost profile if you have uh, you know less and less cobalt, and and two it also improves the uh, I guess the ESG profile. If you don't have, uh, you know, uh, uh, cobalt that's mined in, in um, you know, uh, uh, in certain places that that uh, aren't, aren't aren't the best uh, working conditions. Um, so uh, that that's an independent trend that's going on. Uh, the benefit of LFP, as, as obviously you pointed out, is a very significant announcement. Is, is that you also eliminate the nickel uh, entirely, and then having an iron-based cell. You know, iron is uh, obviously super abundant material, super low cost, uh, and that's what allows LFP to be, you know, in, in those in that mid-single-digit dollars per uh, per kilogram. Uh, but the, the most important takeaway, Adam, really is is that. Um, you know, is it, uh, it's a cathode agnostic design, right? The, the fundamental breakthrough we have is, is a solid state separator that enables a, an anode less lithium anode, and you can couple that uh, with, um, uh, with uh, you know, a, a whatever cathode happens to meet uh, the needs of the application. And given the automotive spectrum is so broad from, you know, uh, super high-end premium vehicles that have, you know, uh, high requirements in terms of range and fast charge, as well as, uh, you know, low-end uh, vehicles where, you know, price is the number one selling uh, criteria uh, and, and um, you know, uh, uh, that, that level of breadth can be fully addressed uh, in um, uh, in a cathode agnostic uh, architecture uh, uh, like like ours. Okay, just one one final one for me, uh, Jagdeep. You you mentioned at the end of the, uh, I think in, in one of the prepared questions <clears throat> that you're going to submit yourselves for independent testing and you're going to provide the results at some uh, time in the future. Uh, can you can you tell us what testing body and and when we might uh, be able to um, see these these results? And again, and understanding that this isn't going to be for every iteration, but um, it does seem, uh, I think it'd be, it would carry a lot of weight. And the fact that you'd even consider to do this suggests that you, you believe it carries some weight as well. Yeah. So this is a, you know, a, 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 a sort of a certified accredited kind of a, a battery test lab. Uh, and um, we actually, we, we actually have already submitted those cells for test, uh, but testing does take time, even at one C, one C rates, you know, it takes some, um, you know, uh, you know, several months to get up to you know, a few hundred cycles. So, uh, you know, when we have those results, uh, we, we will definitely uh, publish them. But you're right. Uh, you know, it is. Um, you know, it, it's it's a. Uh, you know, even though our belief, as I said in the call, is is that you know it, it, what matters the most is 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 the testing that customers do in their labs. Uh, I think mm-hmm. you know some investors uh, do feel more comfortable if there's a third-party lab that's tested, uh, and and um uh, and that's why we're you know we're doing this. So we will definitely publish those results. And and thank you for. Uh, appreciating the point that you know um, we don't tend to do this for every generation of cell, but but I think having uh, having the basic validation uh, could be of value. And, and these were four layer cells or one layer. How, or so this is really just right. uh, you know th- th- these are going to be you know uh, single layer cells uh, to okay. just validate the core the core capabilities of uh, you know what we call the uncompromised test conditions, right? So can you cycle okay. uh, at you know unelevated temperatures uh, at you know uh, unelevated. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, not super high temperature, not super high pressure, you know, high rates of charge and discharge on the cycling, like 1C, 1C, and so on. But we'll publish all that uh, along with the data uh, going forward. We didn't want to get ahead of ourselves and start talking about that too much, given that we don't have the results in yet. So, Thanks, Jackie. Absolutely. Thanks for the question. Our next question is from Gabe Dowd of Cohen. Please ask your question. Hey, afternoon, guys. Thanks for uh, all the prepared remarks so far. Um, maybe just on the 10-layer test, a 10-layer cell, um, Maybe, Jack, if you kind of answer this at the last question, but um, close to 40 cycles or so, when should we expect to see that number get closer to, I guess, the four to 500 cycle uh, a number and then ultimately get to the, the 800 number that you, you guys have targeted for, you know, obviously on a mode of applications? Yeah. So, I mean, I think our target remains uh, end of the year. Uh, and I think the, the, the main point we, we, I think, made on the call is that, you know, having those cells, um, you know, actually be successfully made and go on test and have, you know, encouraging early results. Uh, you know, gives us some 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 level of uh, you know uh, of uh, encouragement that, that you know that we're tracking to the uh, to that end of year goal. Um, you know, there's work to be done, and and primarily that work involves making a lot more of these cells so we can characterize uh, the performance uh, uh, you know, and, and the behavior of of these cells. So uh, you know, um, uh, the, the typical process that we use is you know we make a lot of cells, uh, we we get the data, we use that data to to um, uh, you know improve 
uh, the, the design and, and, and um, you know, uh, uh, and the manufacturing aspects of the cell, uh, and then and then retest. So all that, uh, those are the kind of things we expect to do. But we now and in the year uh, to basically turn that um, you know, those four stem layer cells into what we call uh, baseline cells. And, you know, it's also in the, in the letter we mentioned this, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, learn fast kind of a, a model, uh, and that's really what we're referring to there. Is, is the idea is to do statistically valid, uh, you know, sample sizes that we test, uh, so we can actually draw conclusions based on uh, on the results of those tests that allow us to modify the design in a way that uh, moves us forward on the vector that we are uh, interested in moving on. Got it, got it. Okay, thanks, Andy, that's helpful. And then just a quick follow-up, just going back to the uh, LFP cathode. Uh, obviously, uh, a number of OEMs have highlighted the potential to use LFP for, for lower cost uh, entry models. And so was the decision to, to test um, you know, your cell with an LFP cathode uh, based on a specific request from a potential partner or was it really just to highlight again the the, uh, the cathode agnostic nature of the of the separator? Just trying to get a sense of if it's really more of a more of a pull kind of kind of a request, I guess. Yeah, I understand the question. You know, we, we don't uh, we, as I mentioned, we don't talk about uh, you know customer specifics that aren't you know uh, finalized or announced. So I won't be able to answer that particular question. Uh, but I think um, you know um, uh, the, the the general idea that you know uh, uh, that, that there is a role for a low cost cathode in the automotive uh, you know uh, market. Uh, is really what we're responding to here. So, uh, you know, we've been focused on NMC811 primarily because uh, that kind of highlights the energy density and, and fast charge benefits that we've been talking about. Uh, but we didn't. We want to make sure people weren't thinking that that this um, uh, lithium metal anode less design is somehow tied to any particular cathode. Uh, and and given the the um, sort of the the uh, resurgence of interest in LFP, uh, we we you know we we really um, felt like we had a contribution to make here. Again, remember as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, you know. LFP has a number of advantages over um, the higher energy cathodes, right? It can be, it's obviously lower cost. Uh, it it uh, can be more thermally stable. It can have better cycling performance. Uh, it can even be, you know, higher power uh, density in, in, in depending on how you design the cell. But it has one big disadvantage, which is that it's basically, um, you know, low energy density. Uh, and that hobbles its ap applicability to many uh, applications. So the, the reason why we want to do this demo is make clear that you could take that low cost chemistry, derive the benefits of the low cost and the stability and the, the thermal uh, uh, safety and so on, and just couple that with, uh, with this um, uh, anode-free design uh, that directly addresses the biggest limitation, that's energy density. So the idea of a, a really low-cost design that happens to be, you know, roughly in the same bar ballpark as today's, um, you know, uh, uh, NMC-type chemistries, uh, many OEMs, I think, would consider that to be a pretty, a pretty exciting, you know, product offering. So that's the reason why, why, why we, um, uh, we, we did that demonstration. Got it. Thanks, Ajit. Absolutely. Thanks for the questions. And our next question is from Ben Kalo of Baird. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking my questions. Maybe just uh, jump on the LFP uh, just one final time. Um, it, it's always been a cathode agnostic design. So you're basically just telling us that it works with L LFP, um, uh, an LFP cathode. It hasn't been like a change or anything like that. Is that correct? Uh, I missed the last part of your question, uh, Ben. It hasn't been uh, uh, what? Right, it's, if you're emphasizing it because of the resurgence or if there was some kind of change in testing because I I was I, I thought that it was always a cathode agnostic design. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're absolutely right. it always was a cathode design. It's just, it's just that you know we, we just didn't want um you know people to think that somehow um you know quantum scape was uh, synonymous with NMC because you know uh, our our you know unique contribution is this lithium metal uh, anode less design which is enabled by of course the solid state separator uh, and we we've, we've said before as you pointed out correctly that it's, it's with cathode agnostic but having actual data where we show you know, uh, actual cells constructed with LFP cathodes and our lithium metal anode uh, and solid separator, uh, we think just hammers that point home because um, uh, because those are both interesting cathode materials um, and, and we'll both have a role to play you know over the next next many years going forward. Okay, great. Um, on the uh, head count increase and congratulations, could you just talk about recruiting in this type of environment with you know uh, your battery capacity uh, across the board being ex uh, expands exactly? Yeah, so we've actually had really good luck with recruiting. I mean, we said we've, uh, you know, uh, we grew 20% in the quarter alone, right? So if you analyze that rate, that's a pretty rapid rate of growth. Uh, and we hired a lot of people during the uh, the, the pandemic era uh, you know, of the year last year. Uh, and, and um, you know, we, we've been fortunate to see a lot of great candidates come through. So we were able to uh, really uh, keep the level of quality of, of, uh, of uh, employees that we hire really high. Um, I think that if you are an engineer or scientist working uh, on next generation batteries, my personal opinion is there's really no better place to be than QuantumScape because, you know, this is not incremental stuff. This is disruptive stuff. Uh, you know, we've shown that the core capability, um, you know, uh, uh, is there based on the data we've already published. Uh, and, and um, you know, uh, uh, we have 
you know, because we're so well resourced, we have a really extensive lab in terms of uh, not only, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 battery manufacturing capabilities, but, but, uh, but battery test and characterization uh, and, and uh, metrology capabilities uh, with a lot of tools that, you know, scientists and engineers wouldn't readily have access to, uh, you know, in many other, uh, you know, organizations, whether they're companies or even universities. Uh, so we feel like having the opportunity to work in such a fully equipped lab that's doing cutting edge work uh, has really helped us attract uh, some, some great uh, candidates. Um, the, 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 the two that we spoke about at the senior level, obviously Selena and, and, uh, and Clayton on the manufacturing side are just examples, but, uh, but, but they're just really the tip of the spear. There, there's, um, you know, there's many, many, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, uh, that, that we've hired over, you know, over that last year uh, that, that have allowed us to maintain our momentum uh, going forward here. And then lastly, just with the, you know, the new entrance to the public markets and you know, to the private companies, you know, uh, you know fundraising too, um, has that changed behavior from your know, customers or is, is it kind of like a, a pilot testing uh, across all different products right now? Is that the stage we're in? And, and how do you see that evolving, uh, you know, for people to pick their, uh, uh, pick their uh, horses, I guess, uh, for the lack of a better word, uh, to go with on the technology front? Yeah, I mean, here, here's the way we see it, right? I mean, I'll give you obviously our our opinion. I mean, uh, you know, th- there's a few uh, alternatives if you're an OEM uh, looking for next generation, you know, type of uh, uh, you know uh, breakthrough chemistry, right? There's there's other uh, solid state based approaches uh, other than what QuantumScape is doing. Uh, for example, there's the sulfides, there's the polymers. Uh, the problem with those approaches is that none of them has really shown that they can prevent uh, dendrites under the types of uncompromised conditions that we you know we keep talking about, right? One C, one hour charge and discharge. Uh, 25 to 30 degrees Celsius temperatures, you know, three to four atmospheres of pressure, uh, as opposed to overly elevated temperature and pressures, you know, 100% depth of discharge. Every previous, every other attempt that we've seen uh, for solid state using other materials, um, you know, uh, uh, has not been able to cycle in those conditions. So if someone has got that, you know, that would be exciting news, but we haven't seen that. The, the second category is people that are just using liquids uh, with lithium metal to try to make that work. Um, and you can get, you know, uh, it's easy to get results with liquids at low rates of power, uh, because um, you know uh, dendrites are an exponential function of of, um, uh, of of power, so at more power you can reduce it exponentially. But conversely, at higher powers, that propensity grows exponentially. So uh, you know, and then that's not even taking into account the impedance or the resistance growth that happens from the chemical side reaction between the liquid and the lithium metal. So we think those approaches are, are not going to be uh, viable for applications like automotive, where high power is required. And there may be an application for those in low power type scenarios. That that would be the best case outcome for a liquid based lithium metal approach. And then the final, I think, category is a lot of people working on silicon. And silicon is a fine approach to incrementally improve the energy density of, um, uh, of lithium metal, uh, lithium uh, ion cells. Uh, but in the day, even if you had 100% silicon anode with no carbon, no binder, no electrolyte in it, um, the, just the mass of that silicon alone uh, would double the mass of the anode because silicon has atomic number 28, lithium has atomic number 7. So even if you held four lithium atoms for every one silicon atom, you're still doubling the mass of, and the weight of that, of that anode. So really, at the end of the day, if you have a working lithium metal anode-less design, we honestly just don't see um, a role for, <laughs> for any other approach. So our real challenge is, is not whether there's a better approach out there, but simply whether we can execute on uh, the vision that we've laid out uh, and, and get it to commercial production. And, and that's really what we're focused on. And, you know, and, and, and we think that the progress reporting you know, on this call is, is, is an encouraging sign. Uh, it's obviously not done. We're not claiming that we're shipping, but we believe that, that it's, you know, it's a signal that, uh, that the team is, in fact, um, you know, uh, uh, knows how to execute. And if, if the team keeps doing that, I think we have an opportunity to really, uh, really transform the sector. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Your next question is from Mark Delaney of Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Uh, yes, uh, good afternoon, and thanks for taking the questions. Uh, first, I was hoping you could uh, discuss more on the uh, manufacturing improvements uh, that you talked about relative to separator manufacturing, and uh, n- nice to hear about uh, some, some improvements uh, that you made on the manufacturability of the separator. Could you provide more details about how similar the current uh, manufacturing progress and, and tool set is relative to what you think you may use in volume production uh, for separator manufacturing? Yeah, so let me address that in two different uh, parts. I think, you know, obviously we, we, we keep um, – uh, the, the details of the of the separator process fairly close to the vest because that's really some of our crown jewels uh, as as you obviously know. Um, but but I think the net effect of the improvements that we're talking about uh, was to get films that are high quality and by quality we mean you know uniformity. Uh, so there's lots of different non uniformities uh, that will affect the performance of your uh, of your separator. And the industry, the broader industry that's working on these types of materials, uh, uh, 
you know, doesn't fully understand the, 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 uh, the, the significance of, of these non-uniformities. And I can tell you, there's, you know, everything from compositional non-uniformities to morphology non-uniformities uh, to, you know, uh, defectivity non-uniformities. These are all things that affect the performance of your films. Uh, by film, I mean the separator uh, 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 ceramic. Uh, and and um, so, so the improvements that we're talking about were, were some concrete changes to our process that led to uh, uh, meaningfully better outcomes in terms of quality and consistency. And that's a pretty important point as well. Uh, not only do you want high-quality films, but you want to be able to uh, get those high-quality films, you know, uh, very repeatedly uh, so you get, you know, better yield. Uh, so that, those are really the net effect of the improvements we're talking about. And then relative to, to you know, the tools that we're using, um, you know, as you, if you look at the, 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 the photos in the shoulder letter, uh, that is an image of a continuous flow heat treatment tool. So every ceramic has to go through a heat, heat treatment step. Uh, but uh, most ceramics today, a lot of ceramics today are done in, um, uh, in, in batch um, uh, 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 sort of processes for heat treatment. Uh, and those processes, we believe, are, are, are not uh, very scalable. So what we have here is a continuous flow process. So, you, you know, the separators uh, run through, uh, a, you know, a, a, on a conveyor belt, uh, this heat treatment tool uh, where you have different uh, zones that can apply a different uh, heat treatment profile as the films run through. Uh, and, and that really is what we believe allows us to uh, to have a scalable process uh, is that we, we don't need, uh, you know, these batch heat treatment tools. So those are the two key points I'd make uh, answer your question, Mark. One is, you know, the, the, the net effect of the improvements we're talking about was to make, you know, produce, you know, better uh, quality films with better consistency. And two is, uh, on the scalability side, these uh, continuous flow heat treatment tools that we are uh, now, uh, you know, uh, deploying, uh, we believe, um, uh, really allow us to increase the throughput. And, and also, uh, frankly, to further increase the quality uh, because we think these continuous flow tools uh, have uh, better precision in terms of the uh, the, the heat treatment profile that, that we can apply. No, that's very helpful. Thank you. And for my second question, uh, I was hoping to talk about the uh, testing the company had talked about last quarter about uh, cells with zero externally applied pressure, w- which I think uh, could be relevant uh, potentially uh, for cells that could be sold into the consumer electronics industry. Uh, I apologize if I missed it, but I, I didn't hear an update on uh, testing of, of cells with uh, zero external pressure applied. So is there any progress you can share on that front? Thank you. Excuse me, this is the operator. I apologize, but there will be a silence as the uh, speaker's line got disconnected. Uh, we will resume shortly. One moment. Okay.